And Deborah Houston, uh, comp check for Nick and Bob. Mike, uh, you're loud and clear on board node two. Okay, Nick, I have you the same. You guys, we have you on the big uh, screen down here, too. You look huge. We are. All right, uh, fellas, we appreciate you uh, participating in here. You're t oh, you, oh, that's really good. You guys are. You, you, look, you look awesome. Uh, we've got some great questions here. This was a major competition. We got like thousands of questions, and uh, these are just a few that we uh, we selected to ask you. So we'll get right into it. Uh, first thing is, uh, first question is about the sounds and smells in space. Can you describe how the various parts of the shuttle or the ISS how they smell and some of the sounds that uh, that you hear that might uh, might describe the environment for the for your followers. Well, that's a good question, Mike. Obviously, launch is really noisy, but once you're in space, um, space itself is really quiet, but the inside of the spacecraft um, is never quiet. There's, it's full of fan noise. Um, everywhere you go, there's a fan circulating air because there's no, uh, no convection that on Earth is caused by gravity and temperature differences. There's no convection up here to circulate the air for you. So that's the biggest noise we notice. Um, how about smells, Bob? What do you notice up here? Well, I think one of the most uh, remarkable smells that uh, you notice in space, everything smells relatively similar uh, except for food, uh, and then one other thing. And that, uh, that second thing is the smell that uh, you smell when you actually go into a place that was recently at vacuum. Um, I, I've heard it described as ozone-ish, um, also uh, being attributed to the oxidation of aluminum, but the smell of coming into a, an area that had just been at vacuum, just been at space, uh, is uh, really uh, unique, and I haven't uh, smelled it uh, any place on the ground uh, just uh, coming through the hatch or uh, uh, actually coming back in from an EVA. You can smell the EVA crew members or spacewalkers when they come in. They really have a strong smell, the smell of space. Now, I know the both of you guys very well, and between the three, there's a lot of brain power, and I just can't help to follow up on that question. What, what do you think causes that, that smell of space? What do you, what do you think it is? You think it's actually space or is it something else? I think the, the smell that you get is actually all the hard work of uh, the spacewalkers who are outside. You know, they spend uh, six or eight hours, uh, like yourself, Mike, uh, eight hours on a spacewalk uh, on uh, the last couple that you had on Hubble. Uh, they spend a lot of time outside working, and you can generate probably a pretty good odor. <laughs> Okay. I have a, a way I like to describe that smell to people, Mike. Okay. Uh, that that smell to me is to metal uh, what the smell of toast is to bread, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that's what I always thought. It might be some outgassing going on there. All right, thanks very much. That's question number one. Question number two, we're looking for funny moments. Were there any funny moments, particularly after you first get to space? You know, anything anything unusual, anything funny, when you, know, you unbuckle zero G for the first time? What was that like? I think we were both smiling when we unbuckled. Um, uh, the, the, funny, the funny things are when, when things that you think you had just 10 seconds ago are gone. And, and there's one thing I lost. I still haven't found it five days later. Um, so I, we're too busy to really, really have uh, our humors up at, at full speed. But it is amusing to watch uh, things and people fly around as, as though it were their, their, their first time in a new environment. And for many of us, it, it is the first time in a new environment. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things I wouldn't describe as, uh, you know, kind of funny in the joking sort of a sense, but uh, what was really fun for me uh, on this flight was to see uh, folks get to do things for the first time. And so to see uh, uh, Terry uh, Verts, our pilot, uh, start floating around and try to work his way out of his suit and uh, deal with uh, the challenges of weightness, uh, weightlessness was, a, a, was fun to watch for me, and it was also fun for me to share that experience with him as he uh, went through it for the first time. And for Nick, uh, going out 
the hatch, it was fun for me to watch him go out on his uh, first spacewalk and uh, experience that for the first time. So it's not really funny in the comical sense. Uh, Nick didn't do anything comical during the uh, EVA, but uh, it was fun for me to, to be there for the first time. A couple of folks got to do those things. That's awesome. And uh, kind of following up to what Bob started talking about with the, with the spacewalks, for both of you, can you describe what the Earth looks like? I mean, uh, either through the through the windows of the spaceship is one thing, but what did it? What was your impressions of seeing it from the spacewalk? Well, Mike, I think there's uh, two things that are, are really impressive uh, during the spacewalk. The first one is just the depth of the atmosphere. And so you can see the clouds and the shadow that they cast. I don't know if uh, if you've ever had the experience of uh, being on the ground and then had an airplane fly over you or, or had a, a dense cloud go over you, but uh, that shadow that it cast on the ground, and then that's something that you can really see the depth of the atmosphere and notice how high the clouds actually are. You can also see lightning. You can see cities at night, uh, all that uh, remarkableness that you can look out the window and kind of see through a, just a little small portal. You kind of have the whole horizon out in front of you through your uh, space helmet, and it's, it's really remarkable to just to take that all in. You have to take mental pictures because uh, uh, the, even the cameras that we have uh, don't have a wide enough uh, field of view to, to take uh, all of that in. And, and the other uh, remarkable part of uh, going out for the uh, the spacewalks is is again just uh thinking about all the people who come together to make make it all possible and so it took it takes a giant team on the ground to get us into space and to make it all happen i know you had a great support team on your previous flights and uh we've had a huge support team and just to to know all those people are are rewarded and excited by uh, how things are going during the spacewalk is uh, also a, a pretty neat thing Nick, you want to describe your first look at the Earth from uh, from the helmet visor? It's it's really hard to describe, Mike. I'll try. Uh, we went out of the hatch in the dark, so I couldn't see anything at first except the underside of Space Station and Endeavour, which were lit in floodlights. And that was beautiful enough. Uh, we got working, and at some point uh, in that, I think Steve warned us that uh, our first sunrise was coming up, and I looked towards the horizon, and there was this beautiful blue glow coming towards us. And there isn't much time to watch it, but uh, the once or twice I could watch it during the spacewalk yesterday, uh, it was just amazing. The view is panoramic, as Bob said. You can, in the helmet, you can see so much more than you can through shuttle windows because you can see almost 180 degrees uh, field of view. Um, but the, the, the blue spreads across the horizon and towards you and then uh, turns orange and red and the sun pokes up and the space station is bathed in a brilliant light. Uh, it all happens extremely quickly and of course it happens 16 times a day and it's, it's a really stunning sight from anywhere up here but especially from the inside of a spacesuit. Nice job. It's hard to describe it but you guys did, did really well. And, uh Following up, we have another question related to what you see during a spacewalk. Did you notice any stars while you were spacewalking? I did uh, see some stars, uh, Mike, uh, but they are, are so small compared to actually being able to look at the Earth and see the lightning or to see the cities at night that the stars are, are uh, actually very dim compared to the lit up space station or the uh, space shuttle. Uh, we did see a very good uh, view of the moon. And like I said, the cities at night and the lightning show that you get uh, through the atmosphere is uh, just really remarkable. The stars are uh, a little bit tougher to see. You can break out the colors on individual stars, uh, but uh, they're, they're, they're hard to compare to just all you can see on the ground. As uh, Bob mentioned, the moon, I did uh, watch um, the moon rise uh, behind Bob uh, yesterday once. It, it came up through the atmosphere. I wasn't sure what I was seeing, but it literally rose through the atmosphere. So it was a white moon behind him, a blue haze. Uh, and then uh, all of a sudden it was up in the clear black of space, and uh, I could tell that it really was the moon I'd been looking at. That was really a remarkable thing to see. But I didn't see any stars yesterday. I'll look for them tomorrow. Well, that, that was great descriptions of what you guys saw out there. You know, it's, it's just an incredible experience, and appreciate you sharing that with us. And like you said, you got a couple more opportunities to make some more memories. So, 
Uh, great job on your first EVA, and good luck on the next couple we'll be watching. Um, on to a slightly different topic now. Uh, how are you sleeping? How are your sleep patterns up there, and uh, how are your dreams affected by being in space? Well, uh, sleep patterns aren't affected too much with a couple of exceptions. The first is we have a huge what we call a sleep shift to get here. We needed to launch at 4.30 in the morning Eastern time. And uh, because of the amount of work you have to do when you get to, uh, to space, uh, it takes about a whole afternoon's worth of work to convert the shuttle into something that's appropriate for living in once you've launched. Um, we needed to make that um, just after our lunchtime. So we were sleep shifted by about nine or ten hours to achieve that. Um, and that took us a week or two really to get comfortable with that huge sleep shift. And we're still roughly on that sleep cycle, sleeping when uh, people in North America are awake and uh, we're awake when they're asleep. Um, but up here on, on, on station, now that we've adapted to that sleep schedule, we're more or less sleeping normally. There just isn't as much time for it as we'd like. For us, Mike, it was uh, like making a trip to Tokyo uh, right before we launched. And uh, we did a, about three days before the launch, we did the equivalent of uh, transferring to uh, almost uh, Tokyo time, Tokyo, Japan. And, and uh, going through that uh, is going to happen on the other end when we come back. So I'm sure we'll not only be tired from the mission, but we'll be tired from those uh, two big uh, sleep shifts, uh, as Nick described, when we get back. Well, you have plenty of time to catch up when you get back to Earth. Uh, another question now comes from uh, the Los Famosos, and I'm probably mispronouncing that, uh, sixth graders at the Sherman Middle School in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. So this comes from a bunch of sixth graders, so be prepared. Uh, they want to know, what do you weigh in space? Well, for a, a bunch of sixth graders, they, they asked some uh, pretty tough questions for us. Uh, you know, I think Nick and I probably have well over 30 years of education between the two of us. And uh, getting questions from sixth graders is always the most challenging uh, of them all. But I think Nick just demonstrated, and I think that we both uh, could show you that we, uh, we don't weigh much of anything while we're up here. Nice demonstration. But you know, the sixth graders will probably be interested. Uh, probably be interested to hear, Mike, that although you don't weigh anything, you still have mass. You still have inertia. So if you start something moving, like if I take Bob and I move him towards the camera, and it takes me a second to speed him up. I have to take that same second to slow him down, because he is massive, and just as we all are, he'll keep moving in one direction as long as there's no force acting on him. So there's really some interesting physics to observe up here. Not just the weight, but also the mass. Thanks, Bob. Well done, boys. Uh, moving on to a different topic. Uh, your meals. We have this. This comes from uh, Chef Casey Wilson, and uh, he or she asks, the chef asks, what do your meals consist of, and uh, is there anything specific that you ask to bring up that you're eating that's maybe a little bit uh, different? Well, Mike, uh, I think there's uh, always a, a lot of interest in what type of food we actually eat on orbit, and it's a mixture of, of kind of camping food and military rations and uh, kind of dehydrated things. And so we've kind of got just about everything that you have on the ground just in a slightly different format that we either warm up or add water to and then warm up. So those are kind of the two things that we have. So nothing nothing too fancy as far as uh, chefs go uh, because we don't get to use all the, the, the fancy techniques. We just get to add water or add heat, and uh, that's just about it. For me, um, I brought up some, some chocolates that I like, and I also brought up some uh, breakfast rolls and some fresh fruit because uh, one of the things that you don't have very 
much of up here. Like I said, with all rehydrated or, or food that you just warm up, uh, you don't get a lot of vegetables. So it's, uh, it is nice to, to taste citrus and uh, taste uh, fresh, fresh vegetables during the, the week or two that you're actually on orbit. And when we arrived with the, uh, for the station crew, we actually brought them quite a bit of uh, fresh food. Um, I don't think uh, you can see any more of it here. Actually, you can. There's some of it uh, stowed right above uh, Nick's head up here. There's some oranges and some apples and some avocados and some lemons. So a lot of uh, fresh fruits that uh, only get delivered when there's a, a progress vehicle arriving or a space shuttle arrives to drop some of these things off. Okay, next question comes from uh, uh, Piotrus007, and they want to know how long do you prepare for, a, for your flight? How long do you guys prepare for your space flight? Well, we've been training for about a year, Mike. Um, we got assigned to this mission, I think, in uh, December of uh, 2008. Um, so we trained for just over a year before we launched. But in a way, we've been training for this for all of our lives. Bob and I are both engineers. Um, Bob's an Air Force flight test engineer, and I'm a, a, a civilian um, mechanical engineer, as you know, because we were at school together. Um, but we have literally been training to be astronauts for the last um, 30 or 40 years through our education. Um, one of the things I was struck by yesterday when I was doing my spacewalk is that uh, I think you probably can't feel really comfortable hanging from uh, hanging from a space station 200 miles above the planet going about 18,000 miles an hour unless you're really confident in the physics that you'll just keep going around the planet and won't fall. So in a way, I think we've been training a long, long time. Yeah, well, all that education that you guys have between you comes, comes in handy. Um, next question is from Pawan Mita, and uh, the question is, what types, of, uh, what types of experiments do you have on board? What experiments are you guys doing? I know you're busy with lots of stuff, but if you have any time for experiments, what are you doing? Well, Mike, uh, we do have a, a couple of exper experiments with us, and most of them are biological in nature, really, uh, as far as our flight goes. The space station is doing a, quite a bit of, of a, additional work. Uh, this is a, an assembly mission to the space station, and so we're primarily focused on that. But the, the experiments that we do have, we have one which is a, a experiment to actually control viruses, and so we have a, a they're in a, a contained vessel, and uh, we cycle them through their process trying to activate them and then deactivate them uh, inside their canister to understand what the effects gravity have gravity has on those viruses. We also fly a, a, a big freezer. Um, it's called a glacier, and it keeps uh, biological samples uh, really cold and also allows us to transfer new science materials either to the station or back down from the station. And so just uh, the day that we arrived, I, I opened up that freezer and exchanged uh, some samples that uh, Jeff Williams, the commander of the space station right now, had on board and uh, swapped those out. And I know there'll be a, a, a large number of uh, blood samples and other samples from the crews that have been on orbit to make sure that they've been healthy and understand the effects of uh, gravity. Uh, on their health uh, during their six-month stay on the space station. Boys, I think we have time for one more question, and uh, this one is uh, pertinent to our Twittering in space. Uh, this comes from Rich V. Miller. He wants to know what kind of computer do you use to send your tweets, and Nick, are you able to tweet from space? As you know, Mike, I was tweeting uh, every day before we launched, and uh, unfortunately I haven't had enough time to do, uh, do much tweeting from up here, although I will send another one out today. Um, when I send a tweet, I have to email it to a colleague on the ground who's agreed to post it for me. Um, but when the folks on the space station here send a tweet, they're able to do it directly via a live computer link with a machine down in Mission Control. Um, so they're actually able to uh, directly, if somewhat slowly, post their own tweets. And that's uh, something that uh, TJ Creamer, the ISS flight engineer up here now, um, has just uh, set up with help from colleagues on the ground. So that's a very exciting development for the tweeting community. 
you're busy, Nick, and anything you can send out, I know the folks would be interested in uh, in reading eventually. And uh, we're we're out of time, actually. Uh, and I know you guys are busy and have something else to do. It's been a real honor for me to work as your cap comment to talk to you uh, this evening. It's uh, it's been a real blast, and you guys look great, and you're doing a great job. And we're all proud of everything you guys are doing. doing anything you want to say to wrap up? You want to say hi to anybody or uh, to to uh, thank anyone? Or what, what do you got? Closing closing thoughts for us. Gosh, the foot, I, we're going to thank everybody, uh, but we won't thank everybody. It's a bit like an Oscar speech if you do that. Um, I guess we'd like to thank the people who got us here, our trainers in Houston, um, and uh, the people at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab who uh, make the underwater training possible, and our flight control team on the ground. Um, those are the really important groups to thank. Um, I'd like to thank my family, too, for uh, putting up with my, uh, what should we call it, business travel, which can be demanding. And uh, Nick covered uh, the folks that that uh, have got us to this point and also been uh, supporting us while we're here on orbit. I'd also like to thank uh, my family and uh, my wife, Megan, who's also uh, a Capcom for some other other missions and uh, flew with you, Mike, uh, back to the, the Space Telescope a little bit, uh, a little while back. So I'd like to thank her specifically uh, as well. All right, guys, great job. Uh, this concludes the event. Good luck with the rest of the mission. We'll be talking with you and looking forward to seeing you on the ground here in about a week's time. Thanks, Mike.